Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Academic Dean Iris Bonnet. Good afternoon. On behalf of Harvey Kennedy School, our faculty, our students, our staff, it is my distinct honor and privilege to welcome you this afternoon and tomorrow to Ideasphere. Over the next two days, we will celebrate the launch of the campaign for Harvard Kennedy School, the power of ideas, and the power of people to make the world a better place. You will hear a little later this afternoon from Harvard University President Drew Gilpin Faust and from the Dean of the Harvard Kennedy School, David Elwood, about this campaign and what this means for this institution, for this university, and for the world. But beforehand, you will all have the pleasure to observe a discussion with some of our most distinguished alumni. President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf of Liberia, a mid-career student here graduating in 1972, and President Felipe Calderon, also a mid-career student here, former president of Mexico, he served his country from 2006 to 2012. They will be in discussion with two of our most fabulous students, although, of course, as you know, all our students are just fantastic. But two amazing students, Jen Beck and Amanda Oku Umbaka. Jen is an American citizen who is an MPP student and will graduate this May. She's also the president of our student council and has done wonderful work here at the Kennedy School. Her passion, however, is North Korea. Her passion is to understand this country, to understand the relationships with this country, but also to do work on the ground for Korean families who have been divided on the peninsula. She has traveled in North Korea, written about North Korea, and made a documentary about North Korea. And her dream is to continue that work and work on US policy regarding North Korea. Amanda is a student in our MPA ID program, which means Master in Public Administration in International Development. She will graduate next year. She joins us from her home country, Kenya. She came to us from Yale. She's an avid runner, and her passion is her home country and Africa more generally. She was an election monitor in 2007 and the tumult that resulted after this election in Kenya really motivated her to focus her life and devote her life to public service and public leadership. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome our distinguished guest of this afternoon. President Madam Ellen Johnson Sirleaf uh, is with us today. She's currently serving her second term as the president of Liberia. And as the first female head of state in Africa, she has created unprecedented opportunities for women, not just in Africa, but across the world, by her leadership, um, her vision, as well as by her example. And so you are truly an inspiration, Madam President, and thank you for being with us today. Thank you. 
It is an honor and privilege to introduce President Felipe Calderon, who is currently an Angelopoulos Fellow here at the Kennedy School. I couldn't possibly do justice to all the accomplishments President Calderon had while in office, from introducing universal health care to Mexico, to actually chairing the COP16 on climate change after the Copenhagen round failed. But what resonates most with me in President Calderon's story is his relentless fight to make difficult change, perhaps best illustrated by his um, front on organized crime in Mexico. We were under strict instructions from Madam President to keep this fun and keep this a conversation, so we will stop talking and get straight into it. I think, Madam President and President Calderon, you've both alluded to leadership as a call to service in books and speeches that you've made. Can you share with us a bit about your leadership journey before the presidency and when you got this call to service? If we can start with you, Madam President. I believe my journey started with my childhood, uh, the parents and my upbringing, the fact that they represented a divide, a bridge over a divide in our society, <coughs> that divide represented by indigenous population and, and those the emancipated slaves who found the country, and the fact that they were, they were able to excel on difficult circumstances, both with um, um, illiterate parents. And so that the fact that they rose to, in the case of my father, to become one of the first um, indigenous persons in the, in the legislature, um, and my mother, a, a preacher and teacher, I suppose, started uh, my own uh, joining toward leadership, but then um, also in my childhood, uh, maybe a, well, that had to do with the fact that I was a girl but a tomboy. <laughs> and, and so the many things I did quickly established leadership in, in sports and then, of course, in the classroom. So, <coughs> and and the, the good thing about that is once you you know, one success at one uh, level of leadership is simply motivates you and moves you up the ladder as aspiring to, to better things and the ability to, um, uh, to motivate along the way and, and to inspire people in, in what you do adds uh, momentum uh, to the buildup of that leadership. Well, in my case, uh, probably it started when I was a child, honestly, and I learned, I suppose, from my father. Just figured out what was my Me Mexico, we say, or my Mexico in those years, 60s and 70s. It was, uh, there, was there, there was an authoritarian regime. Basically, all the governors belonged to the same political party, all the mayors, all the senators, all the congressmen. The press was under control of the government. Uh, when students from college trying to protest, they were massacred in 68 and 71. So it was very difficult. Nevertheless, there was like a group of utopian people trying to organize democracy in Mexico in a peaceful way. And one of them was my father. And what is curious is that what I remember about that is my father was always the candidate of the party in town. I was very proud about that, but the reason is nobody else wanted to be the candidate of the opposition party in town. <laughs> and I remember after school I joined him knocking doors and handing out flyers all the time. It was funny. Until when I was like a teenager, I went to him and say, but that's enough for me. No, no campaigns anymore. Because, Father, the people don't care about that. You know? And when the people care, the government steal our votes and our victories. So what is the point? <laughs> and he told me, well, I understand you're angry, your anger. But the point is, we are not here battling for just a victory or a position. We are doing this because it's our moral duty with the country. And if we don't do this, nobody else will do. 
And in this family, we understand this activity as the way in which we love our neighbors. That's the meaning for us of this expression. And forget about the, any victory. And let me tell you, probably you will never see any governor coming from our party, let alone a president. <laughs> uh, but we are fulfilling our moral duty. So that was the reason, and I learned from him later that, as Aristotle says, the aim of the life is happiness. And the real happiness is coming from uh, do, doing good. And the best way to do good things is serving the others. And the best way to serve the others is through public service. And the most sublime way to serve is in public service is politics, especially when you, are, when you do politics in an honest way and following principles. So that's the reason why I understood that doing politics is a way to, the best way to make public service, and public service is a very important way to be happy serving the others. And that's the reason I understood service as a call, call of duty, a moral duty. Okay. So your, your vision to serve others in your country has led you to the path to become president. So take us back to the day after inauguration in 2006. You just won this campaign after an exciting race. This must have been a phenomenal day for you and your family. Um, you, also were fa you were also facing a long list of issues to tackle, um, including uh, fight against organized crime, security issues, economic growth, trying to um, push Mexico to grow its economy. So where did you start? What did your first few weeks look like? Well, the point is, I had a very long transition, in my case, almost five months. So you have time, enough time to think what could be your priorities. Actually, one of the things I learned here at Kennedy School is to establish clear priorities. Yeah. Because it is impossible to do everything. Um, you have no resources to do that. So I established one, a social aspect, which was exactly universal health care for people. So that implied to design a new budget, a new strategy to reinforce a quite important program, the Seguro Popular, Popular Insurance. And so that was in the first day. New budget, new perspective on that. Second, my main object, objective was jobs for Mexican people. We designed a set of uh, structural reforms in the economy. Nevertheless, suddenly, the economic crisis at global level came two years later and there was, the perspective was completely different. Mm -hmm. Jeffrey Frankel, a professor here, uh, told me those days, well, Felipe, we teach you to avoid a new crisis coming from you Latin American countries, but we never teach you to avoid a crisis coming from the United States. Sorry for that. <laughs> uh, uh, but, the, but the problem I, I didn't was I didn't see in that way was organized crime. And what I realized, when I took office, I discovered, we realized that organized crime was advancing and advancing and taking over the control of municipalities, towns, and cities. And nobody, of course, it was a very dangerous issue to confront them and to stop them. But we decided to do that. It was the, the right way to do. It was costly. It was a difficult decision. It was very risky. Me, and, uh, I was, I suffered some threats several times. And it's difficult to understand, but finally we started to rebuild the process in which the state, the legal institutions, the rule of law prevailed. So that's the way in which I could describe the first day. You have one reality, you are imagining, you have a plan, beautiful plan. You can fulfill some parts of the plan, but suddenly the circumstances are completely different than I was expecting before. So McKenna, you talked a lot about these difficult decisions you've had to make, and you talked about the moral obligation you felt to lead. President, Madam President, I imagine at the time when you took power in Liberia, there was a lot of things on your to-do list, and you had to similarly prioritize what you had to do in those first 100 days. I'm curious, is there a time in that first 100 days where you felt like you had to make a decision that challenged your own values and belief system. These difficult decisions that you made, can you talk us through one of those? 
you know, just starting off with a collapse economy, dysfunctional institution, destroyed infrastructure, <clears throat> society displaced. Um, where do you start? I guess the first challenge is, what's the team you put together and how do you balance that team to make sure that you have the young people for a nation that's very young, that you have women who are your key supporters, but that you have the experience factor of someone from the old order. And so balancing that team became for me the, the most important thing um, of getting started. Now, uh, to your question about, you know, well, what's the ma most formidable thing you, you faced? And uh, in our cases, what do you do with, with, um, with warring factions that had just been partially uh, um, disbanded and disarmed, and, and, a, and an army that also had been disbanded. What do you do when, how do you make sure that they feel that they are part? So one of the, one of the biggest decisions was, was, to, was to say to them that, um, you know, we do have an army that disbanded and, and we're not going to let you come back because the, the claim was we have our constitutional right, we were part of the army and therefore you have no right to disband us. And, and so it was to, if one, if one saw some of, the, some of the stories on that where a group of, a group of um, former armed combatants uh, decided to, that they were going to confront me uh, and to say, and my, my choice was to give in and say, you know, um, out of fear, we're going to let you let you go back, or to confront, or to confront them equally, and so uh, that that weighed on me. What do you do? Do you take them on? And indeed, um, and I did. And I, I went up to them and took them on and said, "It's not going to happen." And I think that established uh, authority right there. And so that that's that's when one has to. One faces a decision that can easily change the whole course of, of what may be your plans to, to proceed along a path. So I can only imagine the, the pressure of sitting there thinking that this decision is going to change the course of a series of actions. Did you feel prepared to make that decision? Or put differently, how can one prepare themselves to make these sorts of decisions? How did you do that? That comes from, from the whole totality of your own experience, your, your training, your preparation uh, uh, for the task. Um, but there's nothing that, that prepares you other than that inner will to make a decision that's difficult. And, and at that time, I, when, you, when you face it, is when you find out what you have, what, what courage you have within you uh, to be able to make that. And, uh, and, it, and that, that comes from your own, your, your, own, your own soul and your own ability uh, to make that decision and, and to stand a course. And I'm not, I'm not sure that, that, that one even knows how you'll be prepared for that difficult moment when you're confronting a situation in which Whatever decision you make can make a big difference in maybe in the lives of people or, or a difference in, in the, the, the progress or failure of your nation. What, what do you do? Uh, and for that, each one looks to your own, you know, your own inner strength. And you make that decision and sometimes you get it right. There are other times when you don't. And, and if you don't, you've got to be also prepared for the consequences to pick up the pieces and still go on. Earlier before the session, you spoke briefly about where you find that inner strength um, that continues to help you drive and make difficult decisions amidst um, teams as well as um, challengers. Where do you find that inner strength? I'd love to ask uh, Madam President and President Kelpian. The, the upbringing of one, uh, being able to 
question that challenges you if you're if you're not born into uh, into wealth or into privileges, uh, being able to to stand up there, I think strength of names. Um, the people you meet, uh, the people you interact with, uh, strengthens your resolve. Um, the challenges you face, and for each one it's different, uh, depending on the path that you find yourself on and how you propel yourself and, and how you meet, meet the circumstances uh, and the evolution of your life. And so, um, uh, these very halls and grounds here are, are part of the part of the making and the graining of someone. Just uh, being able to being able to to meet the challenges right here, uh, you know, in the, in the yard or in the square, uh, tells you that that's all part of that's all part of uh, nurturing one and and preparing them to to face those difficult decisions. Well, one thing that I completely agree with, one thing I could add is that you need energy to take decisions and take actions. And probably the energy you need is coming from your honest purpose, if I can say that. So you need a motive. You need something to struggle for. Once you have a clear idea what is exactly you are fighting for, what is your ideas, what is your honest motive, that's the energy that will allow you to take decisions. You have the courage that is completely needed to take difficult decisions because, as Madame President says, you never take easy decisions. Once one decision arrives to your desk, it's because it's a difficult one. So there is no idea that you can decide it. Two <laughs> good things, that's better. No, no. It, between two, you, you need always to decide between two, the less of two evils. That's the problem with that. So you need principles, you need honest motive, you need courage, a lot of courage. And I think you need technical tools, honestly. And that is, again, the importance of Kennedy School. Because it is not enough to have a very good motive to us. You need to have the tool to have at least minimum information from the economic side, a clear reference what is going to happen, what could be the social impact of one decision, and what could be the way in which people will react, what, what are the hidden issues that the society is exactly avoiding to confront. And all those things, all those tools, you can learn exactly here. And finally, you need to follow your instincts. Yes. And you need to be, to have the courage, not, not only to, to take the decisions and to put them in action, but also to pay the price of the consequences, whatever could be your decisions. So President Calderon, hearing you speak about this, I'm just so energized to get more energy and keep doing things. But I think where you've applied this motivation and this energy so strongly is to the fight on organized crime, where I can only imagine the two evils you're dealing with and decisions you're making there. Uh, one of the things that we learn here, and as an MPID, as Dean Bonet had said, where I spent a lot of time doing economics, we always talk about the technically correct solution. And oftentimes that's known. There might be one or two or three, you know, people arguing about which one it is, but the technical solution is known. Whether it's politically feasible, whether you can actually do it based on the capabilities that you have is a different question. So if you think about how you approached the fight on organized crime, which I know is a huge topic, talk us through how you balanced some of these on one of your key issues. How did you play with these issues of economy and politics, and if they're not aligned, how do you make a decision? Well, that's difficult. Ah, it's not fair. <laughs> that's <laughs> difficult. Well, it's, but I think it could be uh, difficult, but very good example. One is, what are your options at hand? You are, I was seeing that these criminals were taking over the control of towns, basically police corps. It is important because there is a moment in which organized crime is not only and not mainly related with exporting drugs to US. Honestly, I don't care how much drugs the Americans want. No? My point was the Mexican people and the Mexican people were suffering about the criminals advancing over the territory because they were looking for new markets. They were looking for control of multiple points of sale. 
So there is a moment in which for mayors and governors, a lot of people in politics is, you just, they are just afraid. They are afraid of other criminals because they, they are threatening on a daily basis. So you have the clear options, just avoid take action, just leave them to do whatever they want. That's an option. And an option that a lot of people follow before me. And the other option is confront them, take the risk, and apply the technical solutions with adaptive possibilities for society. And the technical solutions are if the people, if the police is eroded completely by corruption, you need to rebuild and remove those policemen completely and establish technical solutions. What? Betting processes for all. Uh, you need to pay more to them. We need to take care of their families. You need to, to provide ideals and mystics to them to fight for the people. And at the same time, you need to provide opportunities for the kids in education, social opportunities, jobs, in order to win the race against the criminals in the street. And the adaptive way to do that is, what are your skills? The, for instance, economic skills. Again, there are difficult decisions here, but if you allow the criminals to erode the society, you are losing the, the run for economic prosperity. The main problem in Mexico and a lot of Latin American countries, some of them in Africa as well, the main economic problem is crime. It's lack of rule of law. And we need to address that. So in economic terms, you as government, you establish your priorities. Yes, they have a lot of money, but you have taxes, no? You have more economic power. The state must prevail. And that's basically the idea. And yes, you pay the cost in which the way you are not able to explain to the people what exactly is the problem, that we need to confront together the problem, we need to fix the problem, and we need to pay a cost for that, it's going to be very difficult. But that's true. And for people, sometimes the most difficult problem in society, it's better to avoid them. It's better to say, well, I don't want to confront that. It's some kind of nightmare. You know, it's not a nightmare. These criminals are there in your door. No? Let me, uh, I remember this expression, I, a very bad quote, in, especially in English, but Expression is a poet saying like that, no? When the Nazis came from the communists, I say nothing but because they were communists. And when the Nazis came from the Jewish, I say nothing because they were Jewish. And when the Nazis came for me and my son, I have nothing to say. So for the people, it's better to avoid the problem until the moment in which the problem is impossible to solve. So it was difficult. President Calderon has uh, described um, how leadership is often, it requires compromise and it's not always as her heroic as it's framed in the media or some of our classes. So, uh, Madam President, um, could you describe for us a specific scenario or a decision you had to make that required you to choose between two very difficult choices um, or had to build allies among, among people that you didn't suspect would be part of the team? Well, you know, um, Liberia came out of two decades of civil war <coughs> with, um, with lots of warlords who had gone through the, negotiation, the negotiations of peace and were all now part of the body politic that had to be accommodated. And it was an issue of, do you fit them? Do you fit them on, on the team for, for recovery? Or all because of the role they played, you exclude them. I think in many cases, some that went through the elections and were duly elected despite um, the record that they had, um, and do you work with people like that? And, and the compromise would have to be that if you sense that the person, you know, has reformed and, and wants to be a part of a constructive and positive um, engagement, then you make that compromise, realizing that, that of course, there's always that big question mark on the part of you know, does one really have a partner who has, you know, who has a history of having violated uh, human rights? And so 
Now you, you carry that compromise so far and no further. I, certainly if someone has a, has a problem of the past and, and has gone through the, the process of uh, being accepted by their people and seen as a leader of their people, that can be a constructive force for change. Uh, on the other hand, you have to be very careful that you don't find repeaters in the fr infringement of rights. So you have to find you have to find that uh, you have to find the right balance uh, in in such a compromise. Uh, sometimes uh, sometimes we um, we get very very stern in, in the decision when when we say, well, no, this is a violator, and that violator must be punished as they ought to be punished. Uh, but there are other times when, when uh, in the interest of, of peace, you know, we have to, we have to show a bit more tolerance and flexibility. Time really flew by, and we have time for one more question for this segment of our conversation. So as Amanda was asking the last question that we'll ask the president, um, if anyone in the audience would like to ask a question, we have about 30 minutes to do so. Please start walking and making your way towards some of the mics that we have. There's one, there's two on the floors and two um, in the stairways. So please um, come forward if you have questions. Okay, so it's time for it. Um, but Madam President, you talked about initially building a team and putting together people who have the capabilities and vision to implement the changes that you're looking for. Uh, we've had the distinct pleasure here at the Kennedy School of working with some members of your team, like Declan Fay Kinsaki. And I'm wondering, mm -hmm. since your rise as the first female president in Africa 10 years ago, we've seen people like Joyce Banda in Malawi, we've seen Wagombe, mm -hmm. um, this interim president of Gabon. What do you see your role as in continuing to inspire visionary and capable female leadership, not just within Liberia and within your teams, but more broadly across Africa and the world? Well, my first role is trying to inspire the w those women in the informal sectors who are the real strength of our country. Uh, you're talking about the women farmers. You're talking about the women marketeers. As a matter of fact, if, that's, if strength comes from anywhere, uh, it comes from those women that sit in the sun all day, you know, selling to be able to send their children to school. So I think you know, that's, that's the first calling is what does one do for them? How does one make them um, feel like there's a future in which they have as much hope as anybody else? Um, and then after that is to set the example in, in leadership so that you inspire other women, you inspire young girls uh, to be able to, uh, to do that. And, you know, I, I always... Uh, I always tell the story of um, one of our UNESCO workers who went into the rural areas. Did I tell that story to you, Jane? <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> so, and went into one of the real remote areas, uh, and as she, she approached this rural school, she saw a little girl, a little boy, fighting, and so the the principal came out to admonish the girl on the basis that little girls don't fight, you know? Um, and so you should back, you shouldn't be fighting. And so uh, the girl backed off, and then walked up to the principal and said, teacher, don't forget a woman is president. <laughs> <laughs> That's the inspiration. Yeah. <laughs> it looks like we have a shy group today. We, I don't know if we have any uh, freshmen from the. Oh, please. So, um, so according to forum protocol, please identify yourself and your affiliation. Um, please uh, ask one brief question, uh, no speeches, and please end your question with a question mark. <laughs> Good afternoon. Thank you so much for your attendance here. Um, my name is Brooke Ellison. I am a, a master in public policy student at 
class of 2004, so I'm here for my uh, reunion, my 10-year reunion, so thank you for your time and your insights. Uh, President Calderon, you had mentioned uh, kind of the distinction between adaptive and technical solutions to, uh, to challenges, and that's kind of, I guess, uh, Heifetzian leadership language. Um, so from the kind of the global perspective or the international perspective, is there a problem or a challenge that you think the United States or the, the Obama administration should be applying those very same leadership skills to that is that's not really being addressed in the way that it should be? <laughs> wow, what a question. <laughs> <laughs> well, one is, well, I, uh, I did leadership but with Dean Williams. <laughs> I see the Professor Heifetz over here, the president, but I had not the privilege. But it was a very good one, Coach, actually. I don't like to make such kind of recommendations to the United States of President Obama. I'm work avoidance on that. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, but it's clear, well, uh, we need to go for that. Uh, the United States has or have tremendous responsibility at global level. And clearly, the problem at the global level requires a tremendous leadership. And in some of those problems, a lot of countries are suffering. In my case, I, there are a lot of issues that need, that must be addressed and are, have been avoided. One is weapons. I know that it's a very sensitive issue here. Most of the people support state, the status quo. I'll just say one thing. Since the assault weapons ban expired in 2004, the violence widespread in Mexico and other countries. And 160, we, in my government, we seized 160,000 weapons. Almost 90% of them were sold in American gun shops in the border. I, I don't propose to change the Second Amendment. I respect and admire the American Constitution, but I demand that the American society, Congress, and government need to fix this, because there is a responsibility. <laughs> no? Other, climate change. This week, we knew that the Antarctic went into an irreversible process and that, imply, that implies that the sea level could increase like uh, three or four meters in the next, well, not immediately, not this century, but it's going to happen. Climate change is evident. You have the worst drought ever in California and the worst typhoon ever in Philippines, killing 6,000 people. And the people would suffer un uh, un hunger and a lot of uh, problems. Where is the leadership of the United States? Uh, I see the President Obama is taking steps on that. And I know it's a very difficult issue. There are a lot of problems in order to implement that. But we need to fix the issues. Nobody's winning avoiding that. So the technical solutions are there. You need to reduce your carbon emission. It's clear like that. And the adaptive problem is how to persuade people, companies, interests, governments. We are working on that, and we are working trying to find out an adaptive solution and technical ones, which is I work in the new climate economy. Our purpose is to find a way in which you can combine tackling climate change and at the same time to provide economic growth and job creation. Because I understand that if we don't find an economic uh, pathway to fix this problem is going to be impossible. But uh, my point is, I don't know if there are some lessons to take, but what is clear, there are a lot of problems that demand the leadership, the responsibility, and the historical, uh, historical role of the Americans. The United States has played in the past an incredible role, for instance, defending liberty and freedom in the Second World War. It's time to call that do. Thank you. So we're going to have a gentleman to the, to this mic. Hello, I'm Jacob. I'm a freshman at the college. Um, it, during your speeches, you both mentioned how as soon as you took office, you quickly instituted new reforms that were quite effective. But I'm wondering, throughout your tenure, were there any reforms where you favored more practical solutions that were watered down, but you thought would take effect more quickly? 
So uh, it's simply, we're willing to compromise your ideals for more practical solutions. Um, in the area of integrity, uh, one had to to build the integrity institutions, try to focus on prevention as a long run and more permanent solution to a problem. And that meant that uh, the punishment side had to, in such a way, wait for the reform of the judicial system, even though it might have been just as impacting to have, you know, to have uh, gone ahead and just arrested hundreds of people. And so, try again to find that balance. Uh, sometimes it's very difficult to see which way you go. So one example is, for instance, we had a quite difficult decision between covering completely free the treatment for cancer for children until 18 years old. Finally, we decided to cover that. It was a very high cost. Before the measure, for instance, seven out of 10 kids with leukemia died. Three years later of the measure, seven out of 10 children with leukemia survived. That is a practical difference, I would say. Mm -hmm. good. I will go to um, Hailila, and sorry if you could take the mic now. Hello. My name is Halima, Halima Tuhima, and I'm an MPP student here. Um, President Sirleaf, a few years ago, I saw a picture of African heads of state, and I saw you amongst all these men, and I could almost see a halo around your head. <laughs> <laughs> and to me, that was the greatest inspiration. So thank you. Um, in two weeks uh, from the Kennedy School, I graduate as the first female graduate from Niger um, to get a degree. <laughs> from Harvard University, and they was only able to do so because my parents trusted that I would be safe in school. And uh, a few weeks ago in neighboring Nigeria, 276 girls were kidnapped mm -hmm. by the extremist group Boko Haram. And as an African woman, a Hausa woman from the Sahel, my impression is that the response from the government was inadequate. If you were to be in the shoes of a president who had to deal with a similar issue, keeping in mind the fact that none of the countries in the region are immune to the situation, it's a threat to all the countries in the region, what would you do? What would you do differently? I well, I suppose one could have had a more rapid response to the problem, um, that one might have been more forceful in sending all the troops to, uh, to be able to do this, that one might have even found intermediaries to start an immediate process of mediation uh, to find a way forward. Um, and so sometimes uh, we fall short because we feel we have the strength, you know, the military strength to deal with some of these issues. And, 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 and you're not even sure if, if the military itself is, is, is going to be as committed to carrying out you know the so I, I do believe that uh, the government the government's in a very difficult situation because they must be careful to preserve the lives of uh, of those girls but at the same time with an obligation to do everything they can to free them 
those are some of the difficult choices one faces when, when you really, when you really just have to work on the basis of your instincts and your commitment. Did you have a question? Thank you, uh, President Calderon. Uh, my name is Alfonso Ayala. I am a bid career MPA. Uh, I graduated some years ago. I don't. <laughs> you can tell that. Uh, uh, and I would like to ask you, because you have described the situation you faced when you were president. You described the qualities of governors. You said yep. majors, judges, and federal police, etc. What is, and because of the relationship between that condition and th that situation and the electoral system that produces those elected officials and non-elected or but appointed officials, what are the main challenges that you see for the electoral or elections administration and the elections tribunals? Well, that's uh, a real challenge for the future or, or the present probably in several of our nations. Uh, Tom Schelling, a quite important professor, uh, Peter Kennedy some time ago, uh, researched a lot of organized crime and he defined that the real business of organized crime is extortion. I mean, extracting the rents of the society. He refers to the, the illegal rents of the society, talking about Boston in the 60s, so Boston City in the 60s. Uh, prostitution, uh, gambling, uh, all of them had protection rackets, and the key issue for organized crime is to extract the rents. In all countries in which the law enforcement institutions are so weak, they are able to extract the rents not only of the illegal sector of the economy, because they have no legal protection, that's the reason why they can extract the rents of the illegal side. They are able to take over the police corps or the attorney general offices or even mayor's offices or higher responsibilities. And you point the problem exactly like that. In order to cover their operation, they are able to take politics and politicians. And that's the problem which you find that the criminals are operating under the coverage of the politics. So we need to avoid quickly this situation because one day, sooner or later, the whole state will be in the hands of the criminals. So the good news in Mexico is Mexico is battling and advancing and rebuilding its law enforcement institutions and organized crime is decreasing in power. But there are a lot of nations in this region, Central America and the Caribbean Sea, some nations in Africa, the case, clearly the case of Somalia, in which the criminals are taking over the institutions. So there, there will be no hope for the people. So the problem is big. And the, the first instinct of any people in office is, I don't want to get in trouble because these guys are going to threat my family and myself. I prefer to pass on that. But the problem is if somebody in office pass or even receive bribes from the criminal, you are delivering the full state in the hands of them. Go back to this mic here for a moment. Hello. Uh, my name is Nicolas Anastashvili. I'm a graduating Master of Public Policy student here. Uh, my question is uh, related to uh, the relationship between uh, vulnerability and leadership, and I wanted to hear your thoughts about uh, specifically whether you think uh, leaders need to show their vulnerability, and perhaps you could uh, give some examples of um, cases when you yourself have uh, exposed your vulnerabilities and how they worked out. Thank you. We're always vulnerable as leaders. <laughs> There's no skipping that. Um, if one wants to, to really reach out, um, to see a group of disaffected uh, citizens, you know you, you're vulnerable in, in that you haven't been able to meet 
expectations. Um, but you need to go there and talk about the reality of, of what you're trying to achieve and, and to manage those expectations. Um, so you must accept the fact that you're going to be vulnerable in your responses and your reaction and your, and your attempts to be able to, uh, to, to, to respond to their needs. And so, um, but that, that's part of what leadership is all about. You have to accept that. And sometimes that, that vulnerability can also, um, can also lead you down, down, down a path of extreme uh, criticisms and confrontation. But it's, I, I, there's no way to avoid it. Well, uh, in my case, I, I used to define myself like an old man. You say, I'm a um, standard senior, if I could say that. Just like that. A human with uh, a lot of uh, defect with defects or no? virtues and defects like any other one. Um, I don't pretend to be perfect because I'm not, that's clear, and people is, are not stupid. So I try to be honest with myself. I try to be coherent and congruent. And the most important thing is try to dominate your own instincts and passions, um, defects, exactly. No? Since I was a child, when I started in politics, my first campaign was when I was 22 years old. Everybody knows everything about me. And I'm being a kid, or almost at that time. Uh, for instance, everybody say my temperament is very bad. No, it's very impulsive and aggressive even. So you learn in your life to dominate your own temperament because you know that it is exactly your, one of your vulnerabilities to take relax, breath profound, and take the right decision. Dominate yourself and that's the secret of life. The secret of life is not to come to this beautiful world without that kind of defects. The secret is how to dominate them. You can get it. You don't need to be a um, hypocrite, which is the worst thing in politics. I'm very common, by the way, these days. We'll go up there. Lucy Nesbetta, and I'm an alumna. Uh, President Corazon, I'm curious, given the pernicious and complicated and deeply entrenched role that organized crime is playing in our hemisphere, uh, of your opinion of the decriminalization of narcotic substances? I think that it needs to be studied profoundly and is not studied profoundly yet. It's clear for me there are a set of consequences, good and bad consequences, upside and downside. Uh, in the economic side, the main argument of the people in favor of decriminalize is you can capture, you can avoid the price of, the, of coming from the black market. So in that way, you can reduce the profits, reducing the profits, you, re you reduce the economic incentives for the criminals to get into such a difficult and incredible and violent and cruel business. That could sound correct. However, even in the economic side, we don't know yet what is the slope of the curve, if I can say that. It's really the demand for drugs as inelastic as everybody's saying, because it, it is not, if the demand for drugs is elastic, liberalizing them, you will get the expansion of the market with more consumers, more profits, and then more economic incentives to get into. Now the measures take it, taken in the United States, in some states, could be important to prove what is going to happen with that. What is happening is the market is expanding. And second, in the social arena, the social aspect is quite important to understand the impact, no? The addiction related with drugs, starting at 10 years old, kid or whatever, it's an incredible strong and could provoke an irreversible damages socially. And if it is possible to believe that preventing 
to get direct connection or direct access to drugs is actually good for kids or not? And if we remove that, what could be those? All those analyses, in my opinion, are not made yet. We need to do that. I'm not afraid to take bold decisions, honestly. But I don't like this way to analyze things like uh, uh, everything is fine and beautiful and pink. No? It's about the, the, the benefits, the, the medi medical benefits of the marijuana. Okay, let's ask to the doctors about that. Uh, you would save several answers. When I hear that the medical benefits, is remember myself, the, the medical benefits of the tequila. Tequila is able to fix <laughs> any kind of cold. No? Of if it's not able to cure the cold, at least you will forget the cold immediately. <laughs> because it's uh, good for that, no? no? To the gentleman here. Jonathan Liu, um, uh, joint MBA, MPA uh, student from the class of 2002. It's a question for, for President Calderon. Mexico seems to be going through a lot of very interesting reforms right now and seems to be an inflection in its economy. I'd just be curious on your thoughts on what you think the most important reforms are how you think about the probability of success and what the impact will be on the economy and the people and, and when you think that will actually uh, have, have uh, be, be, be seen. Thanks. Well, in financial terms, public finance is the most important was the pension reform we passed in 2008. Probably nobody is aware of that, but only passing from the old system, from uh, pay-as-you-go system for public servants to a new system of individual retirement accounts, we save at net present value 30 points of GDP for Mexican public finances. It was completely, the, Mexico was the first country in the OECD to fix its entitlements for the future in that sector. But the other currently is the energy reform, in my opinion. I tried to do so, uh, and I was blocked, but finally we got very good results at the beginning. In, uh, the most important was the flexible contracts for Pemex based upon the efficiency of the contract itself. It was not the touchdown I was looking for, but it was a good first and ten, I need to say. But now, with the support of my party in the opposition, which decided to be cooperative instead of blocking the government, Mexico passed a quite important energy reform, and that implied an open future for Mexican people. If, you, if we do the right thing. Now we are in the implementary le implementation in the legislation of that, and as always, the, the devil is in the detail. No? So we need to take care of that, but in my opinion, it's going to be, in economic terms, a very promising one. Okay, so Peter, you'll be our last question. Thank you very much. My name is Peter Harrington. I'm a graduating MPP here from the Kennedy School. Thank you very much, Madam President, Mr. Peniston, for your, for your remarks. You've both reached the, the summit of politics in your countries, but you've also both graduated from the Kennedy School uh, at one time in your life. And I'd be really grateful to hear, first of all, looking back, what that time meant to you then and means to you now, um, you know, your reflection on, on, on the value of your time here. And secondly, for those of us who are possibly starting our own journey, um, kind of up the mountain, so to speak, uh, what personal advice would you give to, you know, to people who, who, who are starting out? and just graduating, thank you. I think the opportunity of being in this environment of preparing one for public service um, enables you to chart a course, determine what you want to pursue in life, be prepared to, to stay that course, um, except that there'll be obstacles, there'll be difficulties. Um, but the strength from what you get from here and from the totality of all your own experiences and preparedness uh, should keep you focused on what you want. Uh, and most times uh, you'll get there with that and don't be distracted by, I mean, Failure is success story uh, inside out. Failure builds you for success. And so be prepared for that. But keep pushing. Yeah. In my case, I, I could suggest, first, don't avoid the quantitative classes. That's important. <laughs> no? 
Second, uh, this syllabus has reasons to be a syllabus. For instance, I remember when I came that I realized that the leadership and negotiation were mandatory classes. I say, oh my God, well, come on. No? <laughs> if I negotiated the trans Mexican transition, transition to democracy, what is the issue for me? However, when I took classes with Iris Bonet, by the way, uh, I learned how much I have left in the table, <laughs> and how much I could gain even more with the right lessons and the right tools. But more than that, the most important recommendation is believe in something. Have an honest motive in your life. And once you pick your right motive, it could be democracy, human rights, climate change, prosperity, justice, whatever. Fight for it with all your heart. And that's the secret of your life. Probably you will be in office, probably not. But providing reasons for your own life, that's the best thing you can do here at Kennedy School and everywhere else. What a wonderful way to end. We're just going to ask the audience members to stay seated. As we say in Kenya, Asante Sana, Madam President, and President Calderon, for sharing your time with us.